and welcome to The Patient Pulse. This month, we're so pleased to welcome Dr. Gregory Piazza to give us a primer on cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, or CVST, a condition that was in the spotlight, so to speak, in April 2021, after several cases were associated with the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine. Dr. Piazza is an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, and the section head of vascular medicine at Brigham Women's Hospital, and an esteemed member of NATF's board of directors. So thanks so much for being here, Dr. Piazza. Take it away. Thanks, Aviva. All right. Well, what I want to do is give us a little bit of a global view of cerebral venous thrombosis. This is thrombosis that includes blood clots in the cerebral veins and the major dural sinuses. It's an uncommon disorder in the general population, but there are other populations where it can be a little bit more common. It has a higher frequency among patients younger than 40 years old, patients with underlying blood clotting disorders, and women who are pregnant or receiving hormonal contraception. We can see here the age and sex distribution. Typically, we see this sort of in early to middle age, and it's more common in women than it is in men. And some of that has to do with the fact that it does seem to be more hormonally mediated, or at least there's a predisposition in women because of estrogen. Here we can see a map or a diagram of the dural sinuses. There are a number of these venous structures that help to drain the brain. And we can see thrombosis in any of these sinuses, as well as the small cortical veins, which extend from the sinuses into the structure of the brain. There are a number of risk factors that have been identified for cerebral venous thrombosis. Like I said, an underlying blood clotting tendency can predispose to this. Important aspects of women's health, pregnancy, being postpartum, hormonal contraception, hormone replacement therapy. Certain infections and inflammatory diseases can lead to cerebral venous thrombosis. This includes localized or systemic infections. Meningitis can do it. We've seen it with COVID-19. Vasculitis or vasculitides is inflammation of the blood vessels. There are a number of those disorders that we take care of in vascular medicine. And then certain inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory bowel disease can predispose to this hematologic or oncologic disorders like cancer, having very high blood counts, very high platelet counts can lead to this. Trauma actually can lead to cerebral sinus thrombosis. So we can see patients who've had head trauma from a car accident or had a neurosurgical procedure develop this. And then even sometimes it's rare, but sometimes patients who've had a lumbar puncture can develop cerebral venous thrombosis. And other things include nephrotic syndromes, which is a type of kidney disease that leads to imbalance in some of the clotting proteins. The way that cerebral venous thrombosis causes symptoms is really divided into two main mechanisms. There's increased pressure inside the small veins and capillaries, and then there's decreased cerebrospinal fluid absorption. Now, all of this kind of leads to increased pressure in the brain. We can see here that there's impaired venous drainage causing the brain tissue to swell and sometimes not to have the best delivery of oxygenated blood. And so that area of the brain can be starved of oxygen and, and be injured that way. Occasionally, the damage to the brain so much that the capillary walls will become weakened, you can actually get bleeding into the brain tissue. That's really the most severe manifestation of cerebral venous thrombosis. And that's where we start to see really dramatic presentations and complicated management. So there are four main clinical syndromes that we typically see with cerebral venous thrombosis. A syndrome of intracranial hypertension or high blood pressure. Patients often have headaches. Sometimes this is misdiagnosed as migraine, but really it's much more serious than that. And the headache can be 
generalized or localized, and it's worse often with position changes or bearing down. And if you look in the eyes, you might see something called papilledema, which is a swelling of the optic disc. Focal deficits can be seen in 44% of patients. They might have weakness of an arm or leg, difficulty speaking. That's more typical of left transverse sinus thrombosis. Seizures can be seen, and that's more typically when patients actually have that venous hemorrhage than we see seizures. Encephalopathy is really a change in mental status. We see that more commonly in elderly patients or patients that have really major cerebral venous thrombosis with swelling of the brain, decreased oxygenation of the brain tissue and injury, or that bleeding that I talked about. Really, the way you make the diagnosis, typically it's seen in patients younger than 50 years old. They'll have acute, subacute, or chronic headaches with unusual features for them. There could be signs of intracranial hypertension, focal neurological abnormalities, and the absence of risk factors for a regular or typical stroke. And then there will be hemorrhagic infarcts, especially if there's multiple areas involved or non-arterial vascular territories. The way we diagnose it is with a CT venogram. So this type of a CT concentrates on the veins and helps us to rapidly and reliably diagnose these blood clots in the cerebral veins. We look for contrast enhancement that might tell us that this is maybe a little bit older of a cerebral venous thrombosis or a chronic one. And a CT venography is very similar to MR venography, MR it being magnetic resonance imaging. That's another way that we might diagnose this. We can see here that this is the superior sagittal sinus. You see it's whitish, full of contrast. But here in the transverse sinus, you see on this side, there's a lot of contrast in there. But here, there's no contrast. It's dark. That's because there's a blood clot there keeping the contrast from filling that venous structure. You can see the big black arrow here pointing to the fact that there's also blood clot in the jugular vein. I mentioned briefly MR venography. That's another way of making this diagnosis. It actually is extremely sensitive. It can detect cerebral venous thrombosis in the different phases, acute, subacute, or chronic. It also helps you to look for some of the tissue injury that can happen after cerebral venous thrombosis. And if you look at guidelines from 2011, they're big fans of MR venography as the way to diagnose this. And here's an example, and we can see that this patient, unfortunately, in the setting of a, a cerebral venous thrombosis has developed a little stroke-type infarction or area of the brain where the blood flow wasn't good, and there's been some injury. And here we can see that there's nice contrast in this left side transverse sinus and sigmoid sinus. And here on the right, the black arrows are pointing to the fact that you can't see the same structure on the right side. It's thrombosed, it's clotted. The prognosis varies. Mortality is about 6% over 30 days, and it depends on how big the thrombosis is. The primary cause of death can be herniation from a large venous hemorrhage. Neurological recovery, the majority of patients will have a complete or partial recovery. About 10% have permanent neurological deficits by 12-month follow-up, and that's usually when there's signs of major hemorrhage. Recurrence is rare but there are some patients at increased risk for having this happen again, and we'll talk about that. And venous thromboembolism can also occur at the same time of this. So we've had patients with DVTs and pulmonary embolism at the same time as, as a cerebral venous thrombosis. The treatment is really blood thinners. We want to prevent that clot from extending. We want to try to open up the, the veins to the brain as much as we can, and we definitely want to prevent DVT and PE from being piled on as a complication of this disease. For risk of intracranial hemorrhage, there was this thought that we wouldn't anticoagulate patients who have intracranial hemorrhage for fear of making it worse, but there have been two randomized controlled trials showing that even when patients have bleeding into the brain, anticoagulation is important. 
and it doesn't really lead to extension of hemorrhage. This observation really supports this hypothesis that improvement in venous outflow obstruction by thinning the blood, breaking up these blood clots actually decreases the high pressures in the brain tissue and reduces the risk of further hemorrhage. So it's almost counterintuitive, but what you want to do is anticoagulate so you can prevent more bleeding. Fibrinolysis is when we use clot busting drugs to break down the blood clot more quickly. It's been considered in patients that have really extensive cerebral venous thrombosis. There are small series that suggest that there might be a benefit, but really if you look at the 2011 guidelines from the American Heart Association, the American Stroke Association, it's a very limited number of patients that would get this therapy has to be really done in an experienced center and in patients who are deteriorating despite blood thinners. Surgery is sometimes considered is, is cranial surgery to relieve the pressure from bleeding that happens due to cerebral venous thrombosis. This is rarely needed and only done in the most extreme of situations. When it comes to duration of therapy, most patients get three to six months. The best therapy, at least right now, is with warfarin, although there are some studies looking at direct oral anticoagulants. Unfortunately, we just don't have as much experience with those drugs as we do with warfarin in this particular disease. If the cerebral venous thrombosis was unprovoked, we might treat for a bit longer, six to 12 months. And if the patient had recurrent cerebral venous thrombosis, if there's DVT or PE complicating the cerebral venous thrombosis, or if there's a severe thrombophilia, we might consider long-term anticoagulation. We also sometimes will re-image the cerebral venous structures, and if they haven't completely resolved their blood clots, we might extend anticoagulation longer. Now, as Aviva mentioned, there's been tremendous interest in this disease in the setting of COVID-19 vaccination. It's a nice paper published in JAMA related to the Johnson & Johnson COVID vaccine. What we can see here is this is the extent of the literature really looking at this complication. We see a report of 12 cases of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis and decreased platelets in the setting of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine out of the incredible number of patients that have been vaccinated with this agent. It's a serious event, but it's rare, 12 cases in the U.S. So putting it into perspective, the risk of getting cerebral venous thrombosis from COVID itself is still much higher, and we want to prevent our patients from getting COVID with vaccination as much as possible. So to summarize, although it's rare in the general population, cerebral venous thrombosis is more common among the young and women and patients with thrombophilia. The pathophysiology or the way that this causes presentations is through increased pressure in the capillaries and veins and decreased absorption of cerebrospinal fluid. The diagnosis really requires us to recognize the potential clinical presentation and then to use direct imaging. I think CT venography or MRI are very good for this. And the big lesson is in contrast to the long held dogma, you actually do want to anticoagulate these patients and you want to anticoagulate them even if there's intracranial hemorrhage, because that's in the long term going to actually reduce that tendency towards bleeding. And uh, with that, I, I thank you for your attention and hope that this brief review was helpful. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful overview and thanks for helping us better understand this condition. And thanks to our listeners for tuning into the webinar and stay tuned for a new episode of Patient Pulse next month.